the dock's new investment option. Lead bullion. Buy your ammunition from the dock today at sdbullion.com. This is the Doc and Eric Dubin with the SD Weekly Metals and Markets. Well, Eric, we've seen a big smash this week in gold and silver just after last week closed with a golden cross. I guess we should say we're not too surprised to see that. Gold down hard, over $100 now off of last week's highs, just shy of $1,400. Um, we're recording this uh, a day early on Thursday after the market closed, and gold has traded under 1300 today. Touched a low of 12.90, and uh, closing uh, the access market here about 12.91. Silver trading uh, really for the past uh, 24 hours back under $20. It hit a low of 19, I think 51 or 52 overnight on Wednesday into Thursday. I guess uh, the point to take is the cartel can read a chart as well as we can, huh, Eric? Yeah, and historically uh, the number one time when the cartel gets really aggressive is when, in fact, technical signals point to positive action um, by standard uh, interpretations. You know, the Golden Cross coincided exactly when uh, gold and silver were pushed down, and within a day or so of the shares also responding in the same way, so that's not too surprising. We also have uh, yesterday being the last day of trade for the April gold contract, and historically, that's one of those days where 85, 95% of the time, uh, the cartel will push prices lower so that people who are taking a bullish position have their contracts uh, expire worthless. And it's a wonderful way of dampering expectations when anyone in the paper markets that is bold enough to step up to the plate when momentum is beginning to manifest, which is exactly what we saw from about, uh, if memory serves, around uh, December 16th or so of last year, going through the ups and downs, but in a stair staircase upward movement uh, that we've seen leading up to about two and a half weeks ago or so, uh, where there was quite a bit of momentum, and even the paper traders were beginning to come back into the market and push upwards prices. So what can you say? You know, there's a lot of things going on that uh, speak to uh, a generally bullish backdrop uh, with geopolitical events going on that are very bullish for gold. And we have the uh, IMF renegotiation discussions when it comes to the dollar reserve status waiting within the SDR system going on. And so the backdrop with the IMF is a positive for gold as well. And we can cite lots of other examples like uh, grave concerns about what's going on in the high credit bubble that's in China and so on and so forth. So there's no reason why gold and silver should be going down at this point on top of the technical pictures and the momentum coming back after a very, very large uh, short-term bear crisis in 2013. But, you know, here we are. The cartel is the primary actor that has pushed prices down in the last two and a half weeks, and it's really not that big of a surprise. Speaking of China, we've had two pretty interesting stories out of China in the past week. Um, we've had the bank run starting on a lot of the more, a couple of the more rural banks. Um, they're not in Shanghai, but uh, some pretty severe bank runs in China beginning this week. And then the other interesting thing was um, Goldman Sachs came out with a report blaming uh, the gold crash, uh, the 2013 gold and silver crash, on China's hedging of physical gold purchases. And Zero Hedge uh, came out and kind of ran with that story in Goldman Sachs research and published a, a really long essay essentially blaming the 2013 metals takedown on China's hedging of physical purchases. And we published a rebuttal to that authored by Dave Kranzler, who we've had on the show. He's a precious metals uh, fund manager that pretty succinctly um, disputed that. And I think um, you and I, Eric, are both in agreement that China's hedging of their physical purchases was not the ultimate cause of the 2013 metals crash. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just the sheer number of contracts that were involved with pushing down to the market greatly exceeds whatever uh, Goldman Sachs would be reporting as uh, China's uh, hedging. You know, it, it, the numbers don't match up. So you have that, and we also have the known fact that about uh, 1,000 metric tons of gold were removed from GLD and other ETFs worldwide. 
as well as Comics' warehouse uh, having uh, 116 metric tons or maybe even more pulled out, and all of that gold flowed into uh, eager and willing uh, demand for physical, uh, at least 85% of it flowing directly to China. And, you know, the sequence of events were that the paper was being sold in the comics, which brought about the lower prices and then the authorized dealers that are able to participate in uh, basket bundling of, of uh, good delivery bars out of GLD would then take physical delivery for uh, the shares that they had accumulated as the rest of the paper market traders on a New York Stock Exchange sold shares of GLD. On the other end of that transaction were the J.P. Morgans and the Goldman Sachs of the world taking those shares, bundling them, taking the gold, sending it off to Switzerland, re having it refabricated into kilo bars, and then off into China. So, you know... It, this is another example of the so-called Goldman Sachs Muppet Brigade, where they put out research that is uh, skewed towards some other uh, you know, ulterior motive, be it uh, fleecing their own customers and people that advise, and those Muppets are just distorting the whole uh, you know narrative on what uh, they probably believe uh, contrary to their research reports. So I don't buy it. I think this is more propaganda than anything else, and it's very easily disputed as uh, Dave Kranzler did a very fine job in that article. Right, and particularly we saw over a thousand tons of gold, physical gold removed from the, the gold ETFs in 2013, as well as um, our friend Alastair McLeod discovery that the Bank of England unloaded about 1,300 tons of gold into the market right around uh, coinciding with that takedown Yeah. when uh, the gold price was taken uh, what, from about 1,600 down to, to 1,400 in a very short amount of time, as well as the historic drawdown in the COMEX vaults. So any of the physical storage depots across the world, be it, be it the Bank of England, the COMEX vaults, um, or the, the, the uh, gold on deposit in the, the ETF, they were all substantially drained in 2013. And, and we should say, too, that when it comes to the Bank of England story, we can't prove that definitively, but it doesn't matter because the ETF story with the 1,000 metric tons is proof sufficient because that gold flowed to China, and China did not possess that gold prior to the core shooting of April, uh, to what was it, April 12 through April 15 of 2013 when uh, you know, more than, for example, 400 metric ton equivalent of paper gold was sold down in a, in a matter of just a cumulative 10-minute period over those days of the Friday to Sunday morning early market hours in, in Asian trading. So that was the core event that started the huge shell sell down in 2013 driven entirely by paper and long before China was being able to accumulate that associated amount of physical gold into their system. So, you know, the, 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 when you investigate events like this, it's always helpful to put things on a timeline. And the timeline clearly debunks uh, Goldman Sachs' theory, so it's enough said. You know, the other thing uh, you'd wanted to talk about was the upcoming um, April G20 meeting. Um, are we going to have that? It does, certainly doesn't look like it at this point, Eric. I don't think they're doing the formal meeting, but there's the discussions around the edges. They have lots of meetings uh, throughout the year, and there you know, was back discussions, back room discussions about the IMF quota and its um, timeline. You know, back in 2010, the Obama administration and the BRIC countries had basically come to an agreement that there would be some kind of renegotiation of the weightings, and I believe the United States has a 17% weighting in the SDR, and um, countries like Spain and other uh, countries in Europe that you know have much smaller economies than many of the BRIC nations have uh, larger quotas. So the idea was to move around the quotas and begin the process of lessening the dollar's role as reserve and trade currency status worldwide and elevating the BRIC countries' status within the IMF system. And though we were only talking about maybe 9% re-weighting uh, in terms of percentage points being moved around, um, and actually, just ironically enough, uh, uh, the, the weightings of European countries were on the table just as much as the dollar. Um, all of this uh, would be 
coming into an evolutionary process, and a lot of people have been looking at uh, April as being some kind of a huge uh, inflection point that could possibly stir stuff up, and I'm more in the camp that it's more of an evolutionary process, but uh, the point being that uh, there isn't a lot of agreement in the United States as to even begin that process. There's a lot of resistance to the dollar uh, losing uh, waiting on a worldwide basis, despite the fact that you know this kind of process is inevitable, and uh, the United States, as an economy relative to rising economies in the BRIC nations, will decline by default. And people worldwide are questioning the store of value function of U.S. dollars when it comes to central banks, reserves, and, and on and on. So the bottom line is that um, despite the fact that a lot of people are looking at April as being an inflection point, I suspect that it's uh, can be more of a bump along the road kind of thing, and um, the, the takeaway point is that we're not dealing with this process overall, and that's what's really scary because at some point in the future, things will come to a head. You have, you know, for example, Russia right now talking about developing an alternative to the SWIFT system, and that's partially motivated by sanctions being threatened uh, on an escalating basis. I mean, so far we've only seen modest sanction regimes being proposed on both sides. But these these uh, indications of financial warfare are escalating, so we need to keep an eye on it and, and see where they develop. Right. Well, switching topics back to the metals a little bit here, I just wanted to provide the listeners uh, another update on the physical markets. And we've been having a, an interesting development over the last week or two, and we're starting to see shortages of gold for the first time. We've been used to shor shortages on silver for the past year or two. But um, the story that's developing, it's uh, about three to four of the authorized primary dealers, author authorized purchasers directly from the U.S. Mint have um, collectively rebelled against the U.S. Mint and have begun to refuse purchasing any of the, the gold eagles, uh, particularly... It started out with the fractional eagles, but they've now even progressed to the one ounce. And then the the reason for this is that uh, the U.S. Mint has, uh, to start the year, for whatever reason, been forcing um, the authorized purchasers to purchase an equal amount of 2012 and 2013 dated coins as well as the 14s. So essentially, if you want to purchase a box of current year gold, the U.S. Mint is forcing um, your company to purchase three boxes of gold. So after collecting a, a pretty large inventory of these backdates and not being able to um, get the supply of currents to meet demand, several of um, the authorized purchasers have all kind of collectively rebelled and um, halted purchases of any U.S. gold coin. And we're beginning to see a, a shortage in the wholesale market, um, particularly in the fractional coins, but even um, late last week started developing in the one ounce gold eagles that uh, the authorized purchasers and the wholesalers did not have any current year gold eagles available. They, they still had quite a few of those backdated, but as far as the current year, none were available. So um, definitely an interesting um, development and shift to have a little bit of a shortage in the retail gold developing versus silver, which has become almost uh, um, a normal occurrence over the last couple of years. It's hard to read what exactly is going on, particularly since they're talking about 2012 inventory, too, hanging around. I mean, what happened? Why was it that they had this uh, for such a long period of time? And, uh, you know, they do have that window of time when they shift to an ongoing or to an, a new year and make available the new annual production. Supposedly, they're supposed to re reconcile their accounts, maybe even may uh, melt stuff down, too. If I'm not mistaken, I've read that they do clean inventory that way when they have things that have um, built up. So it's, it's it's a strange situation. I'm not exactly sure what we can draw from it. The other story that uh, is just developing here on Thursday afternoon, um, again, we're recording the show a day early this week, um, is uh, the story that uh, we broke this afternoon on Thursday that J.P. Morgan's top commercial bankruptcy lawyer um, was killed in an automobile collision, and not only that, but the man who is uh, named Joseph G.M. Papa um, was a J.P. Morgan attorney, and he was their top commercial bankruptcy lawyer, their vice president. 
And a couple interesting uh, facts related to the incident is that he was hit and thrown over 150 feet and then pronounced dead at the scene. And we, Eric and I were chatting a little bit before the show, and if, uh, if you strike someone with a, a vehicle and uh, the person is thrown 150 feet, you certainly are not decelerating your car and hitting the brakes. So we don't have too many more details than that, other than the fact that um, this occurred last Saturday, um, which would have been March 22nd, um, and it was in a somewhat rural location in Ohio. J.P. Morgan does have uh, some headquarters in Columbus, and it wasn't uh, too far away um, from there. But interesting that uh, an Ohio J.P. Morgan top lawyer has been killed in uh, an incident uh, involving a minivan, uh, striking him and throwing him over 150 feet. So it just adds to the, the intrigue and the saga and the string of um, dead bankers, and particularly it seems to be a high proportionate number of them uh, J.P. Morgan bankers. Yeah, we should probably make it as a general call out to the audience if anybody's ever seen any kind of statistical work historically about, you know, in, in wake of all these goofy, strange uh, situations with bankers offing themselves or finding themselves at the hand of an unfortunate accident, I'd be really curious to know, you know, what are the numbers that are typically associated with bankers committing suicide in any given year? <laughs> I haven't been able to find any studies like that. I've looked around for them. I have no idea where to go to actually find, uh, you know, raw ta data that tabulates that. Cause I doubt there's anything like that in the granularity reported by FD FBI statistics or, you know, something similar, for example. Uh, if anybody who is in law enforcement or related field that's listening to this and can get insight into how to actually go about trying to figure out some kind of a historical baseline for comparison to get a better handle on what the heck is going on here, do contact us. We'd love to look into that and we'd certainly be willing to research it. Yeah, there's certainly been a string of, let's uh, to say the least, unusual deaths, whether it uh, was yeah. the nail gun incident with nine shots through a nail gun. And anyone who's ever handled a nail gun knows that uh, you can't just fire it off like a semi-automatic weapon. You have to uh, use force to discharge the nail gun. So uh, to think that you could do that to your abdomen and head uh, with the recoil and then putting up, pressing it up against you and firing it again is pretty and unbelievable. Pain. Exactly. Yeah. And, and then we well, had... Well, we were uh, talking... Go ahead. We were talking earlier about uh, what would probably be a wise thing to discuss with people who are new to the silver and gold market, and that is to... You know, figure out a way and a strategy to deal with really painful periods like what we're going through now. Because if uh, you're new to the market and you look around and you realize that there are definitely reasons why it's wise to have a position for insurance purposes and something that can navigate through a banking crisis or a reserve status change in the dollar that happens over the weekend because of some black swan or just because governments decide to do it at a whim on a particular occasion. You know, the way to best survive is something that most stackers understand, and that's the lion's share of our audience, so we're pleased by that. But anyone who's new to this market really needs to basically, first and foremost, know that you, know, you, you really only want to get a level of exposure that allows you to sleep at night. Nobody can tell you what's right for you. Uh, you have to look at your own financial situation, you know, what kind of uh, expenses and budget you face, and how much uh, free... Uh, capital you have to invest in insurance and whatever is appropriate. Uh, you take the action that allows you to navigate these very painful periods where, you know, everybody begins to get very excited early on in a move and momentum is going up and uh, all you'll hear in the blogosphere is, buy, buy, buy. <laughs> but in reality, that often is the most dangerous time because the cartel does not want gold and silver to rise quickly. That's the number one objective. You know, we are, as we've been saying from the very beginning of this year, in fact, in mid uh, December of last year, is that we are now entering and are firmly in, in my opinion at least, a period of what we describe as managed retreat. The gold and silver fundamentals are so strong that I still move higher this year. And it's just, you know, very little doubt in my mind that that will be the case, but we're going to have a lot of times where, in fact, Prices will be pushed down because the cartel is operating on a thesis of their own managed retreat. They don't want momentum to take over, but they 
eventually we'll back off just enough for prices to move higher and, and kind of let the steam out of the system because at any given point in time, COMEX uh, can you know come under so much stress that uh, they'd have to revert to a cash-based system for settlement or what have you. I mean, manipulation does take a certain amount of physical to actualize the price capping that they do. So, you know, it's very wise to have only a level of exposure that uh, will not put you under severe pain when we, in fact, see market prices going down. And that's something that you've spoken to a lot as well, Doc. Exactly. And, and just one other thing I would add to that is to not buy on margin. That's that's one of the big rules as well is to avoid margin, avoid leverage. If you're not a professional, Credit. if you're not a professional investor, you should not be purchasing um, any investment asset with leverage and margin. Um, we've had customers contact us even this week um, in regards to they've been Monex customers or they're looking uh, to price match Monex and um, some of the other firms that offer um, leverage investments into the metals. They'll they'll let you they'll give you a, a big line of credit with margin and let you purchase 10,000 ounces worth of silver that they'll store in the in their vaults for you. Um, which is great if silver moves up ten dollars in the, the first few weeks or months after um, you sign that contract. But if w whatever the the asset you purchase on margin, if the market moves against you, you're going to see margin calls, and if you're not prepared for that, you could essentially lose your entire position with the market not moving that much. And unfortunately, I've seen it happen with um, acquaintances. Um, customers that have dealt with other firms that you know, they really haven't known what they've been getting into and kind of bought into the deal that uh, get rich quick. Um, well, if silver goes up $10, you'll make a million dollars. Well, there's the other side of it too. If silver goes down a couple of dollars, you, you may not have anything. So that's the other main rule. I know Jim Sinclair has preached on that for years, and I can't preach on it strongly enough as well. Um, avoid margin when you purchase the metals. Okay, so looking ahead to next week, um, we'll see if if Eric's call is uh, correct, that silver can kind of claw its way back above the $20 level, be critical for gold to claw back above the 1300 level and close there. And actually, we still have a day of trading left in Friday. It would be big uh, for both of those metals to regain those levels uh, to close out the week. And we'll keep an eye on the developing story in the gold market with the U.S. Mint uh, selling the backdated coins and the authorized purchasers halting their their purchases as uh, they can't get the current year. So we'll see how that develops, uh, which side backs down, the, the retail side or the mint. Um, so for Eric Dubin and the Doc, thanks for tuning in to this week's SD Weekly Metals and Markets. The Doc's new investment option, lead bullion. Buy your ammunition from the Doc today at sdbullion.com.